Well, welcome everybody to this workshop on digitizing museum objects using photogrammetry. My name is Alejandra Albuerne and I am a lecturer at the UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage. I am really pleased to bring to you today's event, which is hosted by the Institute for Sustainable Heritage as part of the program for the conference that we have organized with the very exciting occasion of the Institute's 20th anniversary. Today is the last day of the conference, which has been running since the start of the week, and I highly recommend attending the closing session on Future Heritage this afternoon. Uh, you can find more details on the ISH website if you're interested. I want to thank my colleagues at ISH, and in particular, the conference chair, Professor Matthias Strilich, for hosting this event as part of the conference. The workshop is organized in collaboration with SHOCK, the European Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud, which I, and I will introduce uh, SHOCK in a minute. It is a free training event that aims to develop data skills within the social sciences and humanities, and more specifically in our case, within heritage science. Before before we get started, I want to share some ground rules uh, for today. Uh, please keep your microphones muted throughout the event. Um, and uh, if you want to communicate with us, uh, use the chat function, um, and as well as any other opportunities that the presenters may, may offer you. Um, I should let you know that uh, the workshop is being recorded. If you do not want to feature in the recording, please keep your camera off. There is also the option to um, rename yourself uh, by clicking on the three dots that appear on the top right of your uh, Zoom tile of your image when you hover uh, over it with your, with your mouse. Um, if, you, if you are happy to be part of the recording, I welcome you to keep your camera on and I will be keeping mine on throughout, throughout the workshop. Um, I would like to tell you that we will be circulating a post-event questionnaire that we would be very grateful uh, if you could fill in. Uh, and now um, to tell you the structure for the day. Uh, first, I will very briefly introduce uh, shock for those of you who have not come across it before. Then I will pass on uh, the floor to my colleague, uh, Adam Gibson, who will talk about uh, the work on, on uh, imaging that we do at the Institute for Sustainable Heritage. And finally, uh, we will pass on the floor to Kira for the main contents of today's workshop. Um, so I will start, uh, I will share my screen. Um, Okay, I think that should be fine. Yes, that's working, yep. Yeah. Um, so as I was saying, I want to, uh, before we get started proper with, with uh, the exciting topic of uh, digitization and photogrammetry, um, I want to quickly introduce uh, the social sciences and humanities open cloud. Um, shock aims to realize the social sciences and humanities part of the European open science cloud known as EOSC. Um, it, is, it is a Horizon 2020 research and innovation action that has the aim of creating, as I was saying, the, this specific component of EOSC, where data, tools, and training will be available and accessible uh, for users of SSH data. The project has 47 partners and it will develop throughout 40 months. And uh, next month, we will be going into the final year of the project. Uh, for those who are not familiar with EOSC, or the European Open Science Cloud is an initiative by the European Commission for developing an e-infrastructure to provide services promoting open science. There are many components to EOSC. One of them is a series of activities that support the integration and consolidation of thematic infrastructure platforms. Uh, Shock is one of these platforms, one of these cluster projects. Um, our focus is on the social sciences and humanities and we sit under EOSC alongside other clusters that focus on other themes like uh, the life sciences or astronomy and particle physics. Um, within Shock. Uh, we aim to generate a range of impact, 
first implementing social science in psychic humanities within EOSC. Uh, but then we're also uh, developing a social sciences and humanities open marketplace that we'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute. Um, we will make available high quality cloud ready tools and high quality social sciences and humanities data uh, that uh, data users may access and use. Um, we will offer secure access mechanisms for SSH data that conforms with EU legal requirements. We will ensure that SSH have state of the art research infrastructures. And finally, we will uh, we aim to maximize data reuse through the promotion of open science and fair principles. Um, the, the partners in shock um, in, are, are quite varied and they include uh, a number of research infrastructures that are linked to the social sciences and humanities because of their theme, all of which are on the road, roadmap of ESFRI, the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructure. Some other partners uh, represent stakeholder groups like LIBA, the League of European Libraries, or Trust IT. There are also, there's also representation from the research community with participation, for example, of universities like University College London, our hosts today. Um, and we also have partners from the technology sector like Semantic Web uh, Company or Center Data. Our work aims to cover the full data cycle uh, we want to ensure that fair principles rule from concept to collection all the way through to analysis and storage. Um, Shock is working in a number of ways to link research communities and e infrastructure. On the one hand, we want to engage and empower the research community by connecting them and building expertise through training networks and events like today's event. On the other hand, we are working with e infrastructures to promote technical skills like innovation in data access and production and linking technologies and services into the SSH cloud. As part of our efforts to connect the two, we are developing what I, have, what I mentioned earlier, the social sciences and humanities open marketplace, where we will make a high quality data tools and services openly available uh, to data producers and users. Alongside this, we will shape and implement governance for fair data that aligns with the overarching EOSC efforts. Um, our objective is to connect with a diversity of stakeholders that engage with the social sciences and humanities. These include universities and researchers and libraries, of course, but also the private sector, policymakers, and civil society in general. The two main ways we will do this is by offering training uh, through a range of events, including today's, uh, and training materials and resources for trainers, uh, and also through the open marketplace that I, that I was just mentioning, uh, where tools and data will be openly accessible. Um, if you have any questions about EOSC, if you want to put them in the chat, I'll try to find a, a moment to answer them throughout the workshop. Uh, if you're interested in what we're doing with Shock, uh, please join our community. If you're data users or uh, data trainers, uh, there can be a lot of opportunities for you to, to engage and learn from Shock. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, yes, and uh, that's it from, from uh, about shock. Uh, and now I would like to, to pass the floor over to uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Adam Gibson, who is Professor of Heritage Science at the UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage. Um, Adam's group uh, applies imaging techniques to aspects of heritage, predominantly multispectral and hyperspectral imaging. And his work has looked, among other things, at painting analysis and feature recovering historic documents. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Adam. Thank you, Anna. I just found out that I can't uh, put my microphone on whilst my screen is shared. So let me do it the other way around. Here we are. I hope that's. Green is now shared successfully. Can you see that? Thank you. 
Well, I've been given the impossible job of um, speaking about the Institute for Sustainable Heritage and imaging in five minutes. And I can only do that by offending lots of people by not talking about the fabulous work that they've done. I'm probably summarizing decades of, of work from tens of people here. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to cheat by describing the Institute for Sustainable Heritage by recommending you to visit our website. The website summarizes the three main aspects of ISH, which is education. We've got three master's programs in sustainable heritage, data science, and heritage evidence foresight and policy. Uh, we've got a wide range of research covering the social sciences and humanities through to science, including, as you'll see, imaging. And I think one of the strengths of ISH is its willingness and openness to to partner with other organizations. So moving to imaging, um, there are many aspects of imaging, of course, and the one I'm not going to talk about because Kira is going to talk about that afterwards is photogrammetry. You've joined this workshop because you want to know about photogrammetry, so you probably know that it consists of taking lots of photographs of an object and then combining them into a 3D model. Reflectance transformation imaging is, is really an extension of photogrammetry. Um, often it's done at fine detail, it's, it, 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 it's done at high, high magnification. And this is some imaging we did in UCL Special Collections, looking at an illuminated um, letter that was about to be restored. And the, the, the red, green, blue image, the, the standard photograph that you would see on, on the left, didn't give the restorers a, a great deal of of, of, of insight into where, what, was be, what was degrading. But we found that the um, reflectance transformation imaging, which you can interact with, it's a, it's a mobile data source. You, you can interactively move the artificial light source about. It lets you see highlights and it really, it, 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 it really showed the areas where the gold leaf was peeling away from the, from the, um, the support. We've done quite a bit of multispectral imaging that consists of a, a high resolution camera that looks down onto a copy stand where we can put books or pages or sheets or, or whatever. And then, and then computer controlled lighting that illuminates the object using different wavelengths. And by putting a filter between the object and the camera, we can exclude the illumination wavelength and look at different wavelengths which are caused by fluorescence. The image that you see on the right is still one of the high points for me, which is when um, a co a, some, somebody brought the, uh, some drawings by Leonardo da Vinci into our lab. And this is a, a silver point drawing. So it's drawn with a silver pen on a gritty paper. And you can see it's flicking between two different images. The brighter image is an uh, image taken under green illumination. So that corresponds to what you would see under, under normal daylight. And you can see that there are, oh, the, so the other image as it, as it flicks is the fluorescence image. And the fluorescence image shows two extra horses and a dog at the bottom half of the page, which are invisible to the naked eye. So by doing this multispectral imaging, we can bring out details which are not normally visible. Hyperspectral imaging is perhaps an extension of, of multispectral imaging. And here you can see a, a hyperspectral hyper scan of a painting by Dante Gabriel Rossetti in the Guildhall Art Gallery. This painting was being restored and they brought it to us to be, to be imaged. And the camera moves across the surface of the painting. Um, it illuminates in white light, but every pixel then is split into its residual colors. So instead of a multispectral imaging, we might get 16 colors from the 16 different illuminations. Here we can get up to 600 colors by splitting the white light into its spectral components. And there we can build up ideas of, of which pigments have been used. We can perhaps see underdrawings. We can see, we, we can see signatures. We can see more detail, again, than you can see to the naked eye. One thing which um, 
and I think is really quite exciting and something which is the way forward here is to take something like hyperspectral imaging, but instead of looking at pigments, we can, we can take signatures from the spectrum that correspond to the chemistry of the object that we're looking at. So here in the middle image, we're looking at the pH. So this is the acidity of the paper. On the right hand side, DP starts the degree of polymerization. So as that gets less, that indicates that the polymers making up the paper are getting shorter. They're, be, they're degrading, so they're, le they're less strong. And that's an indication of where there's more damage to the paper. So we're, we're really quite directly now moving from the optical properties to the chemical and physical properties of the object that we're, that we're looking at. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there in doing that in a more, in, in, uh, in a more generalized way. This, this was done specifically for this object, but I think this is one of the exciting directions that hyperspectral imaging can move in. This is our um, X-ray fluorescence imaging system, which is left intentionally blank because it was delivered a year ago. Now you'll all be as familiar as I am with, with what's happened in the last year. So the uh, X-ray fluorescence system is still wrapped up in its bubble wrap and it's yet to be installed in the system, in the, in the lab. We're very excited when, when the lab opens up again that we'll be able to use this for imaging, Im imaging objects and looking at the elemental composition of the object. It tells us what elements are in the object. We've got a 3D laser scanning system, which we can use for teaching and for um, look, looking at buildings and facades and walls and so on. And that, that works in the in, in visible light, but it's also got a thermal Im imaging attachment, which nicely brings, brings to me to the research priorities that I think we, we, we're going to aim at moving forward. Multimodal imaging, I think one of, the, one of the real opportunities is to bring together these different forms of imaging to offer information which isn't otherwise available. That requires a lot of image processing. So we're fortunate to have our data science for cultural heritage, MSC. Our students can help us with, with some, of the, some of this data processing. And as I said, the chemical imaging that I, that, that I showed halfway through, I think, is a really exciting opportunity for moving hyperspectral imaging into a new area of, of imaging, where we can really tell conservators what they want to know about an object. So that's my lightning tour of imaging at ISH. I don't want to take up any more time because the, the main feature of this workshop is um, Kira Zumkler, who's going to talk about photo, photogrammetry. Kira is a digital imaging expert in cultural imaging, in the, in the cultural imaging sector. I know she's done a lot of photogrammetry and other photography in numerous museums. So over to Kira. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, Adam, for the introduction and Alejandra as well. Um, I'm really looking forward to giving this workshop. Um, as it says in the title, it's basic photogrammetry. So this workshop is very much going to be an introduction. So if you've done a lot of photogrammetry before, hopefully I won't bore you. Hopefully there'll be a few things in there that you might not have heard of, or maybe that were just a little bit unclear. Um, or if you've never heard of photogrammetry before ever, um, then hopefully this will still work for you and not, not be too, um, too advanced. So I'm, I'm trying to bridge that gap. So please bear with me on that one. Um, if at any point you have questions because you didn't understand something, you want me to repeat it, you think actually I've heard to do this differently, why, why is Kira saying we should be doing it that way, please put it in the chat. I'm totally happy to be interrupted and, and read out what's happening in the chat. Um, so that's not a problem for me at all. Um, right, so let's dive straight into it, digitizing museum objects using basic photogrammetry. Um, I always like to start these kind of things with a definition of, of the kind of keyword. So what is photogrammetry? Um, this is a quite highbrow definition. It's the science of obtaining reliable information about physical objects and the environment through processes of recording, measuring, and interpreting photographic images. The slightly more mundane definition that I, um, that I like to give people is, photogrammetry allows you to create three-dimensional digital representations of real-life objects, sites, or landscapes from photographs. 
If that still sounds quite abstract, um, and maybe some of you have never seen a photogrammetry model before, um, let's have a look at one or two models just to kind of get a feel for, for what photogrammetry um, can offer and what it looks like. So the first um, model that I would like to show you is um, of an object in the Science Museum Group collection. This um, model I actually created myself. Um, so let's have a look at that one. So this is Sketchfab. Um, Sketchfab, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's the kind of it's YouTube for 3D models, um, so to speak. So it's a platform where a lot of museums and cultural heritage institutions um, post their 3D models. The British Museum is on there, Louvre is on there. Um, so yeah, check it out if, you, if you're interested in that. So this is what it looks like, the, the model. Um, you can see that you can obviously turn it, look at it from all sides. This object specifically really works well in photogrammetry because you know, the face is obviously of interest. The side is of interest because you have these, these cracks here. The back again is of interest because you have a crack. Same here. Then also the top, because it looks like there might have been a wig attached at some point. And then crucially also there is interest at the bottom. So really, if this was only photographed, you'd need an awful lot of photographs to really show what this object looks like. Obviously, if you want to, you can zoom further in to really kind of get up close. But the beauty about photogrammetry is also that you can check out what's what's happening underneath. So, for example, if we strip away the texture and we kind of we just go to the geometry underneath, you can see a lot of things that before when you have the texture on there, it's a little bit hidden. So once we we take the texture off, basically take the color off, we get a real good feel for what kind of you know, what kind of texture there is and potential damage there is. If you were to do a conservation assessment on this object, you might really be interested in the kind of cracking pattern happening here in the wood. Um, so this is a really, really good way of kind of basically getting rid of the destructions caused by color and just really having a, having a good look at your object. So this is a three dimensional, um, you know, museum object that is fairly easy to digitize because you know, odds are you can you can remove it from the store or from gallery and, and, and put it in a, in, a, in a studio environment and that makes life a lot easier. But obviously you can also create photogrammetry models of actual sites. So this is one um, by a museum in Italy, I believe. Um, so this is a tomb and as you can see in Sketchfab, you can also add information points. So there's a corridor here, there's a funerary cell um, and there's a recess. And so you can kind of, you know, you get a feel for the site as well. So I wanted to show you that it's not just limited to objects, even though today I'll be focusing on, on creating um, photogrammetry model of, models of objects. Obviously, um, you can scale this up. You can even do, you know, landscapes if you've got a drone and, and enough um, storage and computing power. Right, let's go back into the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so how do we use photogrammetry? Um, how do we use it in the cultural heritage sector specifically? Um, well, again, it's the creation of 3D models of objects, sites and surfaces for engagement. So like some of the models you've just seen there, obviously they're on the internet, people can engage with them, people can use them for educational purposes or download them and print off their own Nefertiti bust if they, if they feel like it. Um, so that's a big usage for photogrammetry models. Um, like I said, also 3D prints. So one way museums have started loaning objects is if they're too fragile to be moved to another museum in another country, it might be an option to send a 3D print nowadays. Um, I've also pointed out that um, conservation assessment can really be aided by photogrammetry models. If, for example, you have a piece that has broken off, you could create a photogrammetry model of the, the breakage area and really understand how to piece it back together. Um, architectural drawings. So my background is actually in archaeology and these kind of um, drawings you do a lot as an archaeology um, student and as, as an archaeologist. 
and they usually take a very long time as you can see here in the photograph you know you've got someone drawing two people measuring and you always have you know there's there's room for human error obviously whereas with photogrammetry a lot of this can be automated and if you if you're working to a really good methodology um, you get very very accurate results and another thing to do is topographical maps so there's quite a lot of things that we can um, we can do with photogrammetry so next how does it work so now we understand what we can do with it but how does it actually work um, the fundamental principle used by photogrammetry is triangulation um, which I was told in the UK is being taught in A levels, but I'm, I'm not British, so um, I'm, I'm not quite sure on that. But yeah, it's very, very basic triangulation. It's very straightforward. So essentially, the absolute minimum you need is photographs from at least two different locations. Dissect. Um, that's where you get the X, Y, and Z coordinates. So if I took a picture of my face from here, and of my face from here, and both of those images had, say, my nose in it, where, where those lines of sights intersect, the photogrammetry software can understand where the X, Y, and Z coordinate of my nose is. So um, I've got a few more graphs to make that a bit clearer. So in a single photograph, here you have your image sensor, which is basically your camera. Um, here you have your lens, your focal length. So if you have a single image, of an object here, you get the X and you get the Y, but you're missing the Z, you're missing the depth, yeah? Because you don't, you, you can't tell how close or far away an object is. Very, very, might sound a bit kind of abstract, but haven't we all done this, yeah? We've all stood in front of the Tower of Pisa or the Taj Mahal, and we've, you know, we've stood hundreds and hundreds of meters away from it, and we did something like this. So if you're an alien coming to Earth, you don't understand that the Tower of Pisa is much larger than this, this, this person. Because just from a single image, you don't get the Z. You don't understand the depth. Um, and to kind of keep this even more entertaining, there is one movie, or rather a trilogy, that makes such perfect use of this fact that you can confuse people with the depth, with a Z. Um, anyone has a got, got a guess which movie trilogy that is? Put it in the chat. Which movie trilogy makes perfect use of that not being able to understand the Z? Lord of the Rings. Perfect. Exactly. So if we look at Lord of the Rings, on the left-hand side, that's what it looks like. We have Elijah Wood. We have Ian McKellen. Ian McKellen looks three times the size of The Hobbit which obviously in real life is not the case. So if you look at it from a different angle, you've got your second photograph, and your second photograph gives you the Z, you can see that Elijah Wood actually sits more than a meter behind Ian McKellen, and that's how you get this depth perspective. So that's why you need a second photograph to get the Z. So basically that's what it looks like. You have a photograph of your object from here, you have a photograph of, of your object from here, and where those lines of sight intersect on that specific point, on my nose, on my ear, wherever, um, that's where you get the unique 3D location, so the X, Y, and Z. Um, we've got a question here. Um, I'll read it out loud. Thank you for this interesting and detailed presentation of the technique. I wonder if I may ask what kind of tools do you use to store data coming from the photogram? photogrammetry model. Once you created it, how do you manage to share data that you can infer from the model? Um, I'll talk about that later on. So I'll, I'll continue with um, just talking about um, the technique. And this one I'll, I'll address when we actually talk about creating the photogrammetry model. So if I don't, please remind me that I haven't addressed that, that question. Right, okay, so we were at understanding that you need at least two photographs to get the X, the Y and the Z. And to visualize that one last time, this is what a kind of early model looks like. It's a so-called point cloud. And every single one of these points is a point where the software has understood the X, the Y, and the Z from several photographs of the same point on that object. 
So if you think of it here, you have your first photograph, you have all these points, and there's the red dot. And then you have a photograph of this cube from here. And again, the software finds the red dot. And you have a photograph of this cube from here. And again, the software finds the red dot. And where those lines of sight intersect in the 3D virtual space, the red dot is created. And obviously, the more images you have, the more accurate that dot becomes. Slightly um, difficult statement because you can go overboard. So if you say, you know, like if, if, for example, you now say, oh, well, then I'll take 100 pictures of that same area. So that'll give me the, 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 the most accurate dot location ever. It gets to a point where more images will actually confuse the software. So we do tend to say around nine images of the same area gives you a very good result. Try to go with around nine images. Don't go for 50, don't go for four. Somewhere around nine is, is quite a good sweet spot. Right, so that is how photogrammetry works. Um, there's two methods of creating a photogrammetry model. Um, the very straightforward one that you might have all heard of is just you know, investing in a rotational table. It can be as fancy as this, um, which is you know, several tens of thousands of pounds, or it can be a lazy Susan um, on a kind of serving board, and you know, that has cost you 10 quid. Um, so basically the idea is you have a rotating table, your camera is stable, your lights are stable, the object is placed right bang in the middle of your, of your rotating table, and that then turns, um, so the object turns, the camera stays stable. Alternatively, if you've got a very, very, very big object which doesn't fit on a rotating table or is too heavy, your object stays stable and you move around with the camera and potentially the light. So that's the walk around method. So here you can see that obviously this object is way too big. So what you do is you actually walk around the object. And that's what we'll have a look at later today as well. Right, are there any limitations to photogrammetry? Unfortunately, yes, there are. Um, a lot of people kind of, they first hear of it, they get very excited. Um, they have all these kind of ideas of what you can do with photogrammetry and then reality hits once you've created your first model and you realize that the technology is still evolving. There are still a lot of things we can't, we can't do or we struggle to do or we're just kind of finding out how to do them. Um, and some of these are highly reflective surfaces. So in this object here on the left, you have a mirror here, you have you know, semi-polished brass here. So basically the reason why reflective, object, uh, reflective surfaces or transparent and translucent surfaces as well don't work is because let's take a mirror. If I take a picture of my mirror from here, different things will be reflected in the mirror than if I take it from here. And so how can the software understand what, which points to match in the mirror because the, what is shown in the mirror has changed from image A to image B to image C. So the, the kind of you know, finding that unique point is impossible because something else is being reflected into it all the time. Or if it's transparent, obviously the, the software doesn't understand if they need to look for the points behind the transparent area or on the transparent area. Um, just a quick question. Mike Taylor is asking each point nine images, sequential or in total. Ideally, sequential makes it easier for the software. Um, but sometimes you, you kind of, you know, for example, if you have a difficult area underneath the chin or underneath the nose or underneath the hair, um, you might later go in and take more detailed shots of that area. So ideally sequential, but sometimes it just doesn't work. And then you want to um, just go in and take more detailed shots. Right. Um, other limitations, intricate details. So, you know, like these kind of little cogs here, very, very difficult, again, because finding those unique points makes it very difficult. Deep cavities. If you can't get your camera in into a cavity, you don't have a picture. So you haven't, you know, you can't create a model of it. Um, moving objects and parts. So, for example, if you had um, a hat that you wanted to take a photogrammetry model of and the hat had like a nice feather coming out of it, that feather is going to move between image A, B, and C. No matter how little you breathe, no matter how little you try to move, that feather is going to move. And again, if that feather has moved, 
it's impossible for the software to find the same points in every single image. And then finally, very small objects, so, so say like a, you know, a bee or a tiny ring, um, just because um, you know, the kind of, kind of cameras and, and lenses you need make it quite difficult. Although there have been, people have made progress in the very small object um, area and also in the highly reflective surfaces area. So there is stuff coming, coming there, but in general, that's where it gets quite tricky. Um, another question, and um, what is the best approach to lighting an object? We'll look at that in a second. So um, yeah, we'll have a look at that in a minute. Right, that was an absolute whistle stop tour through the methodology, through how it kind of works in principle, um, photogrammetry, because I really thought I would want to focus on showing you how to actually create a model, because a lot of the questions will actually be highlighted in the process of doing it, rather than me talking about the, the theory of it. Um, so that's what we're going to do next. So I've got a video that I would like to show you. So bear with me on that video because of lockdown. Um, this video was actually, I shot this for my students um, more than a year ago. So sometimes I will address my students in there and say, you already know. So I'll, I'll make sure to kind of put a voice over on top of it and explain wherever it might not become, not be as clear as, as maybe it should be. But basically this video is showing me in the Victorian Albert Museum in the Cast Court Galleries and I am creating a 3D model of um, one of the busts in the Cast Court Galleries. And the idea is really to keep it as simple as possible. I'm using absolute minimal equipment. It's literally just a camera, a tape measure and free software. And that's it. Um, because I think once you, when you start with the basics, you will make a lot of mistakes or certainly things won't go as smoothly as you might want them to. And that's the best way to learn. Like, what have I done that has caused this problem and how can I do it better next time? Rather than trying to do everything perfect and then just one thing is wrong and you, you don't really understand why that is the case. Right, so let's have a look at this. Right. Hello, everyone. So as you can see, we're in the Victorian Albert Museum and the Cast Court Galleries. And today we will be creating a 3D photogrammetry model of um, this bust here to my right. Um, the Cast Courts are actually quite nice to create photogrammetry models because A, the objects are quite accessible. They're not behind glass. They're not really high. Um, I can walk all the way around them. And then also we get a lot of really nice diffused light in this gallery. So if you look at my, um, my object here, I'm not getting any really harsh shadows from sunlight or from maybe um, artificial gallery light. So that's a really easy way for me to create a photogrammetry model. So what I'm alluding to here is when I say there is no harsh shadow on my object. Um, obviously we've, we've all seen this, you know, like a really harsh gallery light and you get shadows underneath the chin and maybe underneath the nose. So the reason why looking at shadows is so important in photogrammetry is any kind of shadows you have when you create your images, when you take your images, those shadows will be permanently baked into your 3D model. You can't get rid of that in post-production or at least it'll take you hours and hours and hours to, you know, not really do it anyways. Like the results just won't be as good. So in photogrammetry, the more shadow neutral you can make an object, the better, because then you can always apply digital shadows to it, but you can't take baked in shadows away as easily. So try and light your object as shadowless as possible. So that brings me to um, the question, Monique's question, um, who's asking what's the best approach to lighting an object. If you're doing this walk around method on an object that size, and with that three dimensionality, I personally would recommend using a ring flash. Ring flashes are very good at um, eliminating shadows and because they stay on your camera and they move with you as you move with your camera. Whereas if you had, for example, um, a stationary softbox, the softbox stays in one place, but you keep moving with your camera. So at some point you you will be where you will directly photograph into the softbox. 
So that makes it, you know, that that creates problems in its own right. So if you have the walk around method, I personally would recommend a ring flash. Obviously, if you're doing this on a turntable, it's a completely different um, different scenario, in which case you can have stable um, lighting scenarios such as with soft boxes. Right, I hope that answers your question and I'll just continue with the video. If the light was a bit more difficult on my object, I might um, consider using flash, um, possibly a ring flash or any kind of other artificial flash. Um, or also what I could be using is a tripod to give me a bit more flexibility in terms of ISO and shutter speed. Um, but today we're going to keep it really, really simple. I'll, it'll just be me and my camera and my object and we'll get on with that. I'll be talking a bit more about um, why a tripod is a very, very sensible idea to be using. But again, I didn't want to use one in this scenario to kind of show you the downsides of not using one. Okay, so um, as you all know, the first step before I even start taking a picture is making sure I have all the correct settings on my camera. So I'll be blending this in in a minute um, to let you know what I've done to my camera, but essentially I've set the correct color space. I'm making sure I'm shooting in RAW um, and any other settings that I apply, um, I make sure that I have that set in my camera before I get started. Right, yeah, so that one I can't stress enough um, because it's such a simple thing to do and it's such an easy thing to overlook. If you're using a camera that allows you to change the color space, cameras by default, even the professional ones, it is highly irritating. Even the professional cameras, when you buy them, by default, they're set to sRGB, which is a smaller color space, um, which primarily works with screen resolution. Now, granted, you know, a 3D model, you tend to look at it on a screen, so you would think, well, why do I need a better color space? Well. If you ever want to print it, or quite frankly, also screens get better and better and better. Um, and so just, just go for the best quality. You might as well if you've got the storage space, um, if, you've, you know, if your camera is able to do it. So please do set it to Adobe RGB. Um, also file format, do yourself a favor. Don't shoot in JPEG, shoot in RAW or TIFFs. Again, if you, if you can, um, but you just get so much more out of your images. There's so much better quality. Um, and then also, if possible, on your camera, turn off image auto-rotate because that tends to confuse the software. They, the software really doesn't like it when your images have been auto-rotated. So just turn that off. And then likewise, GPS location tracking. Sometimes the software tries to align the images using the GPS data rather than the visual data. And again, it just confuses the software. So if you can turn it off, just turn it off. Okay, so once I have set my camera, once I've got everything sorted, the next thing is to figure out what settings I actually need, what shutter speed do I need, what ISO, what aperture. And the crucial bit is that ideally, obviously, we want our entire object to be in focus when we take the pictures, because that'll make it much easier for the software to create a good model. So for that... So what I'm talking about here is you, you've probably all seen these like fancy, um, you know, Instagram images where maybe the eyelash is sharp and everything else blurs out. And that, you know, looks very nice, but obviously that's not what we want with a historic object. We want everything to be sharp because every detail is, is important. So if we take a picture where I say, you know, if this, if, again, my face was the bust, if my eyes are sharp, or my nose isn't sharp and my ears aren't sharp, then again, the software has a very hard time figuring out which points belong to which because you know, that point on my nose isn't sharp anymore and that on my ear isn't sharp anymore in image A, but might be sharp in image B, it might not be sharp in image C. So you want to make sure that everything is as sharp as possible. Um, the most straightforward way of doing that is, is um, increasing your aperture. So if those, those of you who are familiar with cameras, a high aperture number, so an F32, or an F64 usually means a good depth of field, meaning most of my object is in focus or sharp. However, if you have such a high aperture, that then has also repercussions on the other settings that you can use, such as shutter speed or ISO. I'm not going to go into much more detail on that one. If you want me to, then, then I'm happy to answer questions on that. But basically, what you need to understand is that 
the technique I'm about to show you is how to get the best aperture possible, um, which still allows you more flexibility with other settings such as shutter speed or ISO. So let's have a look at that. We need to calculate our depth of field. And as you remember, um, I'm not calculating my depth of field like this or like this. The deepest depth of field I need is in the diagonal. And so... So if that makes sense, um, if I'm taking the picture right front on of my face, then my chin needs to be sharp and the back of my, he my head needs to be sharp, yeah? But that's probably about, I don't know, 20 centimeters. Once I take a picture from up here, this area needs to be sharp as well as this, and that's the diagonal, and the diagonal is longer. Does that make sense? So here, this is short, this is long, but the diagonal is the longest, yeah? So you want to measure the diagonal of your object. He's not as, as um, thick as he is wide, so I'm not taking this diagonal. I'm actually taking this diagonal. And that's about 60 centimeters. So now I know I need a depth of field of about 60 centimeters to get, get everything in focus. I'll be shooting with a Nikon D810. Um, I have a 50 millimeter lens on there. And I know roughly that I want to be 1.5 meters away from my subject. So I want to. So the reason why I know I want to be 1.5 centimeters away from my subject is because, like I said, I'm shooting on a DA10, a 50 millimeter lens. And so what you want to do in photogrammetry, you want to make sure your frame, the frame you have in your camera, is nicely filled by the object. You don't want the object to be tiny in your frame. You don't want the object to be larger than your frame, so you're cutting it off. So you, let me, let me quickly show you, you want you don't want this on the left, the object is too small. You don't want this on the right, the object is being cut off. So you want to nicely frame it with a little bit of wriggle room to, at all sides. So in my case, because I'm on a 50 mil lens, that means I have to be 1.5 meters away. Shoot from about here. So with all that in mind, I can now put this in my, my calculator and it'll tell me that I can shoot on an F11. So I'll blend this in in a second and uh, you can see what I'm doing. So depth of field calculators, I've got one on my phone, just, you know, downloaded. I think it's called, um, what's it called? Uh, Hyper focal point. It's completely for free. Or if you've got the internet, you know, just Google depth of field calculator. You can see here, I'm choosing the camera I'm using. I'm putting in the focal length that I'm using. So the, the lens, um, I'm putting in the subject distance and then Basically, at that point, the only thing that I can fiddle with is the aperture. Um, so at the moment, you can see, so I've put that in 50. You can see how stuff is changing down here. Then here with the centimeters, I still need to put in 150. And you can see here, now I have a depth of field of 61.44 centimeters at an aperture of f11. Now I could change this to say an f8, and then this number would change as well. But because I know I need 60 centimeters, you just change this aperture setting as until you get to the depth of field you need. So in our case, that's an F11. So Claire is asking, how does that work for very large objects? Yes, um, you know, say we, well, we, as in the Science Museum, not myself, but colleagues of mine um, in the Science Museum did a photogrammetry model of a locomotive. And obviously that is a very, very large object. Um, if you've got a laser measure, that might give you a good idea. Um, that's probably what I would recommend having, investing in. Um, obviously, if you're talking something even larger than that, um, like you're kind of getting to a point where achieving depth of field becomes very difficult anyways, because your object is so large. Um, so you will have to make other compromises. Um, yeah, just, I guess, try and measure it so that you feel more more secure in, in the kind of settings you use. Try and use a, a laser measure. Um, but I appreciate that's not always, that's not always possible. Um, if anyone's got a different idea, put it in the chat. If you've done a massive object, I haven't done really large objects myself. 
Um, but yes, if anyone has done it, please put it put it in there. Yeah, I would I would try and use a, a laser measure. Right. Okay. So let's continue with this one. Right. Okay. So I've set my camera to the settings that I've just discussed. I've got it on an f11. Um, which gives me a shutter speed, or rather I know I can hold a shutter speed of roughly 1 40th of a second without blurring it from, from um, my own movements. And because it's fairly dark in here, even though it doesn't look like it, I have to be on an ISO of 3000, so that's quite high, and ideally I wouldn't be here. So if I did have a tripod with me, this would be the ideal scenario to use my tripod, because I can have as long a shutter speed as I want within reason, and so I would be able to decrease my ISO. Right, okay, so that actually ties into the, uh, the question from Tony, who's asking, shouldn't one simply shoot for maximum depth of field that the lighting and hand shutter speed allows? So basically, in this case, I'm saying I'm using a 1 40th of a second um, shutter speed, because I personally know I can hand hold that shutter speed without shaking too much and blowing my images. If I had coffee that morning, maybe not, but that's roughly what I can hold. Um, in this case, so if I just simply went for the, the highest depth of field, um, well, what, what is that? I could go for an F22, I could go for an F25, but that would mean I'm, I'm having to be on a higher ISO than absolutely necessary. So you basically, you want to be on the lowest aperture setting you can be to enable you to have a low ISO and just about acceptable shutter speed. Now, if I had a tripod, I wouldn't have to worry about that so much because I could, you know, I could be on, say, an ISO 100 and ISO 200 because I could get away with a very long shutter speed. But because I haven't got one, I need to make sure that I have the perfect compromise between aperture shutter speed and ISO. So I can't just simply be like, oh, well, I'll, I'll go for a high shutter, uh, aperture because that gives me depth of field and then I'll adjust the rest. That's why you kind of have to be working in those margins. But again, if you have a tripod, brilliant, makes your life an awful lot easier. But because today it's literally just me and my camera, and this is just the setting I have to accept. I could sacrifice some of my depth of field, go down to, say, an F8, and then have a lower ISO. So that's a discussion that you have to have with yourself if that's something preferable to you. Maybe, for example, you have a camera that doesn't perform very well with a high ISO. And so you might want to sacrifice your depth of field. But my camera is actually quite good with high ISO and I want to have my depth of field. So that's just the, the, the kind of decision I've made. Right, I'm going to jump in here just because I'm mindful of time um, and speed it up a little bit by talking about what's going to come next. So at this point, I have set my, my camera to the settings I want it to be. Um, both in terms of you know, using RAW and uh, Adobe RGB, but also I figured out my, my aperture shutter speed and ISO. And so the next thing for me would be to actually have a look at my object and really understand what could be the tricky areas. So in this case, the tricky areas is gonna be under the chin, under the nose, and here in the back underneath his head. So that's where I would want to take some detail shots. So I need to remember if I use, for example, a freeware such as 3DF Zephyr, 3DF Sapphire only allows me to use 50 images for free. So I then need to remember, okay, I can't take, I have to leave enough images to take pictures from underneath the chin and underneath the nose. So really have a look at your object and really um, try to understand the kind of tricky areas that you might come across. Um, and then the next thing, especially if you're photographing in a museum, don't just look at your object, look at the surroundings as well. Walk around your object, note where the other objects are, because once you have the camera in front of your face, you wouldn't believe how much unaware you become of your surroundings. And it's so easy to bump into any other museum object. So please make sure not only to look at the object you're taking pictures of, but also really become aware of your surroundings. So in this case, actually, this plinth here was an issue for me. So when I came to came, came to this area, I really had to remind myself, take the camera down, realize where you are, and make sure everything stays safe. You, the object, the equipment, everything. So really, you know, I, I can't stress that enough. If you're doing that in a museum, please, please make sure that 
that that's something you take um, into account. Right, um, so the next thing you would do is you could start taking your images. Now, if you're using a software that you've paid for, such as Agisoft Metashape or Capture Reality, um, then you're usually not limited by the amount of images you can put into that software. So, you know, the sky is the limit and your computer power is the limit. Whereas if you just want to give it a go and see whether this is something that, that you might want to make use of, I would recommend a um, software called 3DF Zephyr. Let's see, 3DF Zephyr. There we go. Um, so that is, to my knowledge, the only um, kind of more advanced photogrammetry software currently on the market that allows you to, um, you know, unlimited um, kind of trial time using that software. The only limitation it has is that you can only use 50 images to create your 3D model. So in this case, what I would do is if I only if I was limited to 50 images, I would make my life an awful lot easy by saying I'm going to take an image clockwise. So I'm going to do one at 12, one, two, three, four, five. So when I walk around my object, um, that makes it really quite easy for me. So here we go. So I'm basically a point where I just have to be very mindful. There you go. That's me kind of talking about being mindful with a plinth. So now I'm at the six o'clock position, moving on to the seven and so on and so forth. So that makes it fairly easy for me. And then I do one round roughly at the height of the object here. So that gives me 12 images. I will do another round slightly higher up, another 12. Another round where again, my camera will be somewhere up here. Another 12 images gives me 36 images, gives me plenty and plenty of images to take detailed shots of underneath the chin, the nose, the hair, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's how I would go about this. But you could obviously, if you're doing this with say something like Capture Reality or, or Metashape, um, I would, take them closer together. So roughly what we say is you want to have um, two thirds overlap between images. So as you move, don't make a massive step. Don't make a tiny step. Two thirds overlap between images is roughly what you want. So yeah, if, if my entire face is in the first image, two thirds in the next, one third in the next. And as you move around, that's how you cover your object. Does that make sense? Cool, okay. Um, and also those two thirds, so you have them here at that angle, yeah? You have the two thirds overlap in the X as well as the Y. So when you start lifting your camera up and going higher to somewhere like say here, make sure you're also not lifting it from down here all the way up here, lift it from here to here to here to here. So you have those two thirds, you're making sure that you have enough overlap. That roughly gives you those nine interest points, those nine images per interest point. Um, in this scenario up here, again, it would be incredibly helpful to have a tripod. You might even want to have a, um, you know, a separate monitor wired to your camera so you can actually see that you're keeping it in focus. Um, but again, in this case, what I did, I would just turn on the live view um, to at least have an inkling of whether I was having everything in focus or not. Um, there is a question here. Um, how do you photograph the bottom of the object, especially if they're delicate? Always talk to your conservator first. Always, always consult your conservator. Um, chat to them. Talk to them about how you can maybe make some sort of mount to safely turn the object on its head and photograph the, the underneath, quite often the answer will be you simply can't because conservation will be too concerned about the, um, the integrity of the object. Um, but yeah, if conservation is happy with it, usually they will build a mount for you and then they will help you turn the object and then you can take a picture of it that way. Right. Okay, so now you've got all your images, you've walked around it once at that height, another time at that height, another time at that height. Again, if you can take more images, I would probably have 
five rounds rather than three. So I would do one here, 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 and one from the top. But because we're sticking to the 50 limit in this case, I did one here, one here, and one here. And then the next thing you would do is also, um, you know, take some detail shots from underneath, like I said, and then import everything into your software. Um, so in this case, I'm using Adobe Lightroom, Adobe Bridge also works, or again, if you want to use um, a freeware, then Darktable is something that I would recommend. Um, Alejandro is just saying for anyone who needs to leave, just to remind you that the recording will be made available and we will notify attendance when it is. Yeah, so sorry, we're all running a little bit, um, but yeah, you can, you can always catch up. Um, so if you've done, you know, you've got all your images in Lightroom now, what you will probably do is adjust the highlights and the shadows a little bit. You can see here in my histogram, the top right, that we're, we could have gone a little bit further in the right. It could have been a little bit brighter. So what I will probably do is um, just adjust this minimally. But again, this is, this is for minimal adjustment. This isn't to save a rubbish photograph. If you've got a rubbish photograph, go back to it again. Yeah, so this is not a kind of like, oh, well, I can't be bothered, so I'll just do it in post-production. You'll really get a much worse um, model out of it. So this is only really to tweak it a little bit. Usually what I would recommend is, is working quite a bit on the shadows, because again, the more kind of shadows you have in there, they'll become permanently baked into your object. So once you've done those adjustments, and obviously make sure you do your white balance, um, I'm not going to go into detail what white balance is, that's a completely different lecture altogether, but make sure you do your white balance. Um, adjust a little bit the highlights, the shadows, um, potentially the curve. Um, don't sharpen. It's just, yeah, I would, I would shy away from sharpening because it makes it just, it decreases the, the quality of your final model. Um, and also make sure that any kind of lens adjustments or so on you make just make a note of that because potentially some of these adjustments can actually make your model worse because the software then struggles to understand what you've done prior to importing them into the software. So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, so yeah, here I'm showing, I've done quite a bit to the highlights and the shadows. Um, again, you know, it's your judgment call here because, because I was working with a fairly high ISO um, I felt like I needed to adjust it a little bit. Again, ideally, I wouldn't be doing this. Ideally, I really, really, really should have had a tripod. Tripod would have been absolutely golden in that scenario. But because I didn't have one, you kind of just make do with what you've got. Right, you export your images and you bring it into your photogrammetry software. In this case, this is what um, 3D Zephyr looks like. Um, and a lot of these photogrammetry softwares they are quite daunting at the beginning, but there's absolute, there's so much stuff online. Um, YouTube is your friend. Um, there is just so much information on there. Um, there's lots of forums where people um, share knowledge. If you've got any questions, should you know, send me an email. I've got, um, got my details for you at the end of this. So I'm, I'm happy to help. Um, there is a question from Adam. Kira, if someone wanted to try photogrammetry for the first time, perhaps at home, what would be the best kind of object to choose for the easiest possible model recovery? A trainer, training shoes, running shoes, by far the easiest object, because no side is the same. So it has very different geometry throughout the entire object. Um, it tends to be matte, so there tends to be no reflective stuff on it, or the reflective bits are very minimal, so it tends to be fabric and therefore quite matte. Um, everyone's got them. Everyone, well, most people have running shoes of some sort. sort. Um, yeah, by far the easiest thing everyone has at home, I would say, is to try it on a running shoe. Um, right, yeah, so then in these softwares, usually, you know, you go up to um, up here to work for, and those softwares are really quite helpful in the sense that um, when you go up here, it kind of the first the first step you need to do is also tends to be the first step when you click onto workflow and the next step and the next. Um, and so what you would do is you create a um, point cloud first. 
a sparse point cloud, which is basically the first time the software tries to, um, to match individual points in your photographs. From there, you get, go to a dense point cloud, then you create a mesh and a texture. Um, I'm not going to go through that because, again, there's just not enough time for that, and there's plenty of, of, of videos out there. But I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions either today or if you, if you drop me an email. So what I just briefly want to show you here is um, how well or rather how not well this model did. Um, to also encourage you, like you will fail, you will fail an awful lot. And even if you're a professional, you will sometimes just create a model that you ask yourself, why is it not working? That's just the nature of, of photogrammetry. Obviously, the more advanced you get, hopefully the less that will happen, but it can still happen. Um, and so here you can see that there's something funny going on in front of his face. So this looks like one of the photographs hasn't aligned properly. And so there is there's texture of a, of a photograph on his face that shouldn't be there. Um, there is also this kind of, you know, like leftover bits at the bottom. That's completely normal. That happens. That's just what happens. So you need to get rid of that in post-production. Um, what else have we got? We've got something in the back. Akira, sorry, can I ask you something yeah, regarding sure. the, the bottom? So what if uh, the conservator give you the, the permission and you can photo shoot the, the bottom? In this case, this, will the software recognize that the picture you took from the bottom mm -hmm. goes? Yeah, very, I have to go there. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Um, if you have shot this on a turntable, with pristine white background, nothing to confuse the software. You might have even gone as far as masking out the background. Then the software has a good shot at auto aligning top and bottom. I have, so the Christian Martyr that you saw, that one I shot on a turntable with a clean white background, I cut out all the background before I asked the software to assemble it and it worked, it aligned it without me having to do anything. That doesn't happen very often. Um, what you would have to do instead is you create a model of the top, you create a model of the bottom, and then you manually tell the software point A of the top is point B of the bottom, point C of the top is point D of the bottom, and that allows the software to kind of digitally glue it together at the right points. All Does right. it make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah? Okay. Our software can do that, so Agisoft and... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. They do. Not a problem. Okay. They can. Oh, they can do that. Yeah. Great. Um, I believe, actually, hang on. I think Agisoft MetaShape. You might need the professional version rather than the limited one to do that. But I'm. Don't. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. But I think there might be limitations there. Um, and then Dan is asking, how do you deal with background information? Do you mean these kind of artifacts here happening? This kind of stuff. Yeah, okay. Um, obviously, any kind of deleting of data you do, you run the issue of deleting data that you might want to have captured. So you might have to delete some bits of the bus that you want to, or you, you, you've done that without realizing that that's what you did. Um, if it's just a model for fun and games, then that's totally fine. Just clean it up, make it look nice. You have like, snipping tools up here, which basically allow you to erase points, clean it up, um, maybe put it on a nice base if you if you know enough um, kind of post-production software to do that. But because you're working with a heritage object and any kind of manipulation you do to the digital version of your heritage object can potentially lead to misinterpretations of what it is. I mean, for me, with heritage objects, you want to stay as close to the original as you possibly can. So if you have to do any sort of editing, note that down um, and publish that where, alongside your model. So when you publish your model, push the metadata and the paradata as well, in which you said, I use this camera with that lighting on that day, in that location, I used this software. I took those steps to make my model look X, Y, and Z way. So that when a researcher looks at your model and is like, oh, hang on a minute, that base looks 
shorter than I thought it would be. They realize it looks shorter because you've done something to the model and the original actually has a longer base. So it's just all about transparency. Um, so you're asking, so the manipulation is all done within the software? Yes, correct. Yeah, you do that in the photogrammetry software. Okay, so um, here in this case, you can see again, like some things have just not worked very well. The back, I think also looks a bit funky if we can, if I can find it. Um, but anyways, um, lessons learned, I guess, in that case is, again, I said it many times, but use a tripod if you've got one, use one, it's the best investment you will make if you try photogrammetry. Um, because a lot of the kind of issues you saw in that model um, might have come from having used very high ISO, which makes my images very noisy. And that can then lead to um, the software not really understanding how things work together. Then um, the next lesson learned from that model is um, use the flash where possible light the object more evenly because again um, you can get these baked in shadows but also because we had to use fairly high ISO because we weren't using flash again it, it makes it much harder for the software to align things properly. Um, another lesson learned is um, identify misaligned images and delete or disable or realign them. So when you go through these stops, steps in the self software, the software will tell you 40 out of 50 images have aligned. Then you try and align those 10 missing images. There are various ways of doing it. Again, tons of stuff of that in the YouTube, in, on YouTube or, or manuals. So try and align them. If it still doesn't work, ask yourself, why is it not aligning? Is it because I've taken, I've not stuck to my two thirds overlap? Maybe I only have one third overlap because I've taken too far a step. Maybe I have too close overlap. And so the software gets confused that way. Or, you know, and then if you realize, oh, I haven't got enough overlap, you have to go back and take more images. That's the only way to solve that issue. Um, or, you, you know, you might have to retake the entire set. So really ask yourself, why is it not aligning? What is happening? What have I done wrong? And then you learn and next time you'll realize, oh, actually, when I take details from underneath the chin, I need to have, you know, I need to make sure I have enough overlap to tie that into my entire image set. Um, so those are the kind of key takeaways from what this looked like. The final key takeaway is you can also try different software. It's, Sad as it is, um, and again, you know, I really don't want to say that 3D FFI isn't doing a banging job because it is the only, it's one of the few softwares out there that you can use that's really user friendly and that that is for free. But I did actually put those image sets into Agisoft MetaShape, and um, you can see the face worked. Um, the the face wasn't a problem. Um, also, the back looked much better. So sometimes the unfortunate answer is you you know you got to pay for the good software um, because you'll just get you know you you get quite a different answer um, to to the same image set. Um, right, I'll probably stop here. Um, I could go on and on and on and on, but um, we're already eighteen minutes over. So um, I guess I'll just ask for a last round of questions, um, if that's okay. And then, um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And like I said, um, please do get in touch. Um, I'm more than happy to, to help, you know, to help and, and, and answer any questions you have as, as much as I can anyways. Um, there is one question from Rafaela. Is it possible to use it on paintings? Yes, it works really well on paintings. And it's much easier than doing it on a 3D object. So you get incredibly good results on a painting. If you stick to, with paintings, it's incredibly important, stick to the two thirds overlap. If you stick to the two thirds overlap and you have good lighting, you get incredible results on paintings. Um, just another question, uh, in an uncontrolled environment, um, we can have a lot of trash if we delete that trash. We are losing, sorry, I'm not, 
entirely sure I'm following your question, so you might want to ask that one again. Um, there is a question from Astrid. Can you take detailed pictures like a texture or does the software not connect the points? Um, as in take, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand your question, but is it take details of a specific area and then hope that ties it in? If that is your question, then again, if you try and make sure to, um, to have your two thirds overlap, then it should be able to tie it in. But I think, sorry, I'm, I'm realizing we're, we're going on over time now. So um, I'll stop here. But like I said, you've got, you know, you've got my, um, my email address here. So just, just get in touch and I'll, I'll answer any questions that way. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Kira, for a fascinating presentation and introduction to, to use uh, photogrammetry. I'm sure it's going to help uh, everybody who has attended. Uh, um, and thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, Kira has uh, very generously shared her contact email address, so um, follow up on her invitation if you, if you have any, any questions. And thank you very much, Adam, as well, for joining us and presenting the work that ISH is doing on imaging. Um, we'll leave it here. Uh, I look forward to uh, the final session of the workshop later this afternoon and all those present, uh, you will receive uh, updates from us, uh, a feedback questionnaire, and also we will let you know when the recording is available online. Thank you very much.